Just as you take your seats this morning, we don't turn it down, we don't switch off, we just turn up the heat, because <laughs> he's turning up the heat. His glory remains. His glory remains. But let's just continue in the glory of God this morning. What God's put on my heart this morning for us as a body and those listening online. It may be phrases or words that you've heard before, you've read before. In fact, I know it is because we talk about it a lot, but there's times like these where I don't want to stand in the way of what God is doing. I just want to be able to build and equip you this morning and give word substance to what we're experiencing in times like these. So are you all with me this morning? You can wave because Jesus was waving at us this morning. How many of you felt that? Hey, I, I felt it. He was waving me down. <laughs> Jane, it's me. Oh, I just love it. I love it. He's doing a new thing in our midst. Amen. And um, we are getting excited. And what we're learning is not to steward a move of God. I mean, that just sounds awful, that man would try and steward a move of God. But God's told us to steward our hearts. And so whatever he does from day to day, from week to week, from moment to moment, all we need to do is steward our hearts and keep our hearts in that place before him and let him do what he wants to do. Isn't that the most freeing thing ever? <clears throat> I'm so hot. <laughs> Sweaty hot. <laughs> so, um, so this morning I'd like to share on um, something we talk about, as I said, something we sing about, and something we said at the time of our salvation. And uh, I just felt the Lord in the last couple of weeks just increasing it inside of me. And that's the everlasting life of God, eternal life. And uh, I want to start by saying that our minds alone cannot fathom eternal life. So if we try and work it out and try and think it through, and uh, even put language to it. We, we cannot do it with our minds. It's something that we grasp with our spirit. And so just as we know as a church to worship him in spirit, let's receive the word in spirit, not just for our own intellect and understanding this morning. So our minds can't comprehend it, but it is essential that every believer grasp it in the spirit. Okay, so I'm going to just give a very quick foundation on this and then move on a little bit. But if you've got your Bibles, if you turn to Ecclesiastes 3 verse 11, for the sake of time, although we're not about time anymore, hey, especially when we're talking about eternity. Um, anyway, it says, basically I'll summarize it, all things have been made beautiful in its time. And that he has put eternity in the heart of every man. And when you think of that in your mind, you go, that's nice. What does that absolutely mean to me? Um, because we have an understanding with our own human intellect and mind of what eternity is. And we're going to shatter that today. So it says that the world and all he created, it's far too big and far too marvelous to contain. Don't you feel it when you're in the glorious presence of God in worship? You can just feel the bigness and the magnitude and the, the marvelous expanse of who he is, creation, uh, the universe, everything he created. It, it's too much to contain it. For me, what happens now is I'm just experiencing this lately. My body vibrates inside. I cannot. It's like the cells in my body uh, respond like nature does. Nature responds to the glory of God, and our bodies are actually, when we're filled with the glory of God, we cannot remain the same. We cannot contain it. It's got to come out somehow. 
And before I go on, I, I've <laughs> stopped burning on my heart. Um, the last few weeks I've been saying that we, as a community, are going to sing out the rest of 2020. We're going to shout out the rest of 2020. Psalms wasn't written for when you're lying in your bed going off to sleep to think about the Lord, the Lamb of God, you know, under a tree. He is so mighty and so powerful that he, his breath in us, has got to come out. And it's for a time such as this that we are going to become human trumpets. We read about the trumpets in Psalms. We read about the trumpets in Revelations. You and I are the human trumpet. You and I are the human trumpet that is going to sound in these days. And you know what? It's going to bring back the return of the Lord. It's going to usher in the return of our Lord and Savior. And if we have to die in this earthly realm before he comes, usher yourself into the glory with the sound and breath of God. So we're going we're gonna to practice that. We're going to get out of our comfort zones, and we're not going to live convenient lives anymore. We're going to put our foot fr uh, forward and be front-footed in that. Well, I am, and I know you're going to come with me. So we can't fathom this, this bigness. And, and then what he says about this eternity is that he knew us before we were in our mother's womb. And his plan for us is also, so the, he knew us in our mother's womb beforehand. And then his plan for us is to rule and reign with him after life, the life we know. So that is the everlasting way that he has for every single one of us. From, you know, he, he died on the cross. He was crucified. It's like he, he took care of the sin of the world, and then he said, and here's your future. He took, he's the ancient of days. He went right back into time and took each and every one of us out of that. So whatever you have done in your life, <laughs> yesterday, 30 minutes ago, it's been dealt with. It's been dealt with. We're free. We don't have to look back anymore because he's the ancient of days. He's taken care of that, and he's drawing us and pulling us into a future with him where we rule and reign with him. This is the everlasting way that we live in. And in John 3.16, how many, we could all recite that. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. He so loved. Everything he is doing right now is because he loves us. Everything he's done, because he loved us. Everything he's doing now is because he loves us. So he gave us his only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish or die, but have everlasting, eternal life. So the reason he came is what? Is to give us eternal life. Okay, stay with me. So avoiding hell is not the goal of salvation. Avoiding hell is not the goal of salvation. Now, I'm saying these things and you go, yeah, I know that. No, no, I know. We have fullness of life. Where is it? Can you experience, are you experiencing it? Are you living in the fullness of life? So avoiding hell is not the goal of salvation. But you know what? If it was just that, it's worth preaching. It's, it's worth preaching about if it was just that. But it's not. It's more. So John 17 verse 3 and says, and this is eternal life, that we might know him, the only true God, Jesus Christ, who was sent. Eternal life is knowing God. And some of you might be saying, oh, no, is that all? I, I, like when I was just writing these notes, I heard that, you know, so it's even coming from my own head. Uh, is that all? It's knowing God. We think we know him, but we're still dissatisfied. We say we know him, but we sometimes doubt. Do I know him? Because knowing him is eternal life. Do I know him? So eternal life is not knowing God when we die. Now, I know there's instances when people die and they cross over and go into glory and, and the thief on the cross went. He didn't live a, a godly life, the believing in Jesus. So there are those moments, and it's the mercy and grace of God. But for those of us 
who have made that decision and confessed with our mouth in this life, we have a road to live which doesn't end there. And it's not that we're living this life so that we die, we have eternal life. We have eternal life now. Everlasting life is knowing God intimately and closely, and it is a present tense reality to be possessed. Eternal life is a reality to be possessed now. So that is the foundation of eternal life. Now you know that eternal life is knowing God. So in our desire to know God, why do we have those moments when it's difficult to stay close? Why does our language change? How, how many have said this? I've said it before. I'm just not in a good place with God, so I can't really come to that. Or so-and-so is in such a strong place, I wish I was like her. How many of you have said that, or him? So there seems to be like a perpetual cycle of like a, a wishy-washiness that he's washing out of his bride. <laughs> he's washing it out. He's no more wishy, it's just washy. <laughs> he's washing it out. It's like we're so in and out or up and down, and it's a perpetual cycle that we live in. And he is coming because he loves us so much, he can't leave us the same. And those things are changing in us. And um, it's, like, it's like I feel that what he's doing now, and it's not a harsh thing I'm saying now because it is out of love, but he's not tolerating it anymore in his bride. Every one of you, the bride of Christ, you're feeling at this moment the, the winnowing fork of the Spirit in your own life. I am. It's like when I just, my default is no longer, wow, uh, it's right before my eyes now. And I go, I can't think like that like I always do. I can't do that anymore. I can't watch that anymore. Because if he can't tolerate it anymore, then I shouldn't. And this is not law. I, I love the grace of God. But that winnowing fork of the Spirit at a time such as this is moving in between and over us and through us to make the change. So as he's doing that, the question is, is he Lord or is he not? Now, we said those words once upon a time. I receive you as Lord and Savior. And that's the most beautiful prayer you could ever pray. But the Spirit of God is saying, Lordship, Lordship. Lordship, let's make the change. Let's make the alterations and adjustments. The Lordship of Christ in my life cannot be absent from my love for him. I can't just stay and remain that I love God and I'm following him if I don't have him as Lord. Lordship cannot be absent from my loving him, okay? So I'm not born again now, so when I die, I can hopefully go to heaven. Because if you un try and understand eternal life with the mind, and you haven't grasped it inside here, there's like that little uncertainty. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. It's when you say, yeah, when I die. Because why do we fear when we're approaching death? There's that little uncertainty maybe that, oof, is this really real, what I've believed all my life? Because you can't sustain that kind of thinking too long. It has to come from here. It's, it's grasping, it, grasping it in the spirit. So I'm born again now so that now I can live under his lordship with, the, with his authority. I'm now living in him. I'm living to him and for him. And it's no longer I live, but Christ that lives in me. So we cannot know him or have an understanding of eternal life in us without handing over ownership. Ownership every day. You know, you can say it once, but boy, you're challenged with it the next day on every single thing in your life. So when you come in the glory of God and can't contain it because his presence is so mighty and powerful, tomorrow 
where there's no band and there's, there's no group of people together singing and shouting and going crazy for him because, boy, it really does help, hey? It just propels you into his presence. But when there's not that, do you still believe the same? You might not feel the same way tomorrow, but do you still believe? And that's what he's doing in us. So it's, it's impossible to have a real relationship if you haven't given your all. So giving ownership over to God, allowing him to be Lord, is giving him your all. We can't have covenant with God. What is covenant with God? That intimate, close, knowing relationship with God. We can't have that while having a relationship with the world. That is so basic, 101, A, B, C. But if I'm feeling it, then Holy Spirit's saying, Jane, there's some stuff where you are loving a little bit of the world. And if I'm feeling it, I know you're feeling it too. And um, I can't move on with one foot there. God is not tolerating it anymore. I can't live. I'm just going to give an example. I can't live having a husband and then another lover. Okay, just think of it in the context of marriage. I can't be married to Grant, my husband, who I have covenant with, and then have another lover. Okay? If I try, have the two going, I end up maintaining a relationship with the one that I made covenant with. If I try and have two going, I end up only maintaining something with the one that I made covenant with. You see, a life outside of lordship with him is just maintenance. A life with him as Lord, the one true love, that life is governed by him. I'm in his authority. My life takes on his course. I am bent for him. We've been reading about the Welsh revival and Evan Roberts that prayer, that famous prayer that we all read about. And he says, bend me, oh God, bend us, bend us. And I was like, what does that actually mean? Because it's like old English, you know. And it's, it's to take on the course of. It's to be bent for him. I'm taking on his course. That's the everlasting way. It's the only way. As believers, it's the only way. As believers, it's the only way. <laughs> I've been reading through the, the Gospels and just doing a little bit of a study there. And the Gospel of Matthew is first for a reason. I love this. Because Matthew's perspective and account of Jesus and the Gospel, the way he saw Jesus and the way he saw the same events that the others were documenting and writing about, he saw it. His perspective was different than the others. He saw Jesus as royalty. He saw him as Lord. And you, if you go into Matthew, you can see all of that. He, the scriptures that he, he, he writes there the, and documents, it's all about the lordship and the authority of Christ in a believer's life. And in that authority, we go into all the world. It's a little different in every single gospel. It's quite fascinating. And so it's not by chance that the events that Matthew accounted for came first because what has to happen is first we need to make him Lord before we see him as that and love him as that. And he has to be Lord. So I love that. I love that. So without lordship, we are tossed around by every wind. So just think about that. If you find yourself, wow, I, I'm listening to that. I'm watching YouTube. On that. I'm, watching, I'm listening to that prophet. I'm listening to that new revelation. And, and all you do is search through YouTube and scroll the different people's revelations. Okay, it's all beautiful. It's all good. But without him being Lord, you're going to be tossed around. You're not going to have your own conviction, your own revelation and understanding and your own relationship with God. Okay, so Lordship is the key. 
Shall we read Galatians 2.20? I love that. Is this I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. Just stop there and read that because by faith we are now living in Christ. Okay? Our lives have been crucified with Christ, but now by faith I live in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You know, all the time that the disciples were with Jesus, although they followed him, they struggled to understand all that he was saying. You can see that, the questions they asked him. They struggled to understand and grasp what was going on, and Jesus was with them. They doubted, they denied him in the moment where it mattered most. And even after the cross, the disciples went a little quiet. And they were a bit scattered. And they were confused. They didn't really know what to do or how to be. So think about your own walk with God. Do you follow him? Yes, you follow him. But do you struggle to grasp things, or do you at times doubt and fall away? Yes, sometimes. And sometimes do you get quiet on him? We only get quiet with God when we feel shame and guilt, and we don't believe who we are in Christ. So what was it that changed it for the disciples? And what is it that can change it for us today? You're all going to say? Maybe you all say different things. Yes, but the resurrection of Jesus. The resurrection of Jesus. When Jesus took care of sin once and for all, and when he was raised to life, he abolished death, it says. He abolished death. And then something shifted in them at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came. Why? Okay. That that act of being raised from the dead marks us different to anybody else, any other religion, because we're not a religion. But it is it is the very essence, the most essential thing for us to believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, because he abolished death. If he abolished death, we have everlasting life. Okay? So the same spirit that was released over them all and in them all at Pentecost, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the grave, now lived in them and now lives in you and me. The same resurrected spirit of God now lives in you and me. And so eternal life was given for us to possess now. Now they were able to fulfill the great commission going into all the world. And what what was that great commission saying? Going to all the world. What does it say? Say it with me. Preach the gospel. Cleanse the, hey? Heal the sick. Cast out demons. Okay? Raise the dead. Okay? Why could they do that now? Remember they were quiet and they were a little confused and they were scattered. They didn't know what to do. But when he was risen, when he raised, was raised to life and the Holy Spirit came upon them, they were raised to life. Okay? They were raised to life. And when you and I make the resurrected, only true God, Lord of our lives, in every way, we will live with eternity in our hearts, with his authority, with his strength, and his life. Let's read Romans 14. Romans 14, verse 8 to 9. It says, for if we live, we live to the Lord. How's that? If we live, we live to the Lord. I love that. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. Whether we live, his lordship is ours. Whether we die, his lordship is ours. For to this end, Christ died and lived again. There it is. 
He died and he lived again that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. So why do we fear anything? Why do we fear coronavirus? Why do we fear every um, infirmity and sickness and disease? Why do we fear death? I felt today if we can grasp the reality of the resurrected, risen power of Jesus, it can abolish death even in our thinking, even in our thought life. It abolishes it. And we can live free now. We can live free and, and in that everlasting way. I mean, how long is eternity? Who knows? We don't know. How long is it? It's just a joy to know that we can run through this life, past this life, into the next living for him, free, knowing who he is, knowing what heaven's about, because if you know him, you know what heaven's like. Because that's our home. So I looked up the word lordship in the dictionary, but not for what it means, because we know what it means, but I looked up the opposite, the antonym. I like English. It says, the dictionary describes these words as being the opposite of lordship. And guess what it is? Powerlessness. Weakness. Without the lordship of Jesus in our everyday life, we're powerless. We're weak. So, yeah, just let that settle. Because if we choose the lordship of Jesus in everything, we're We're not going to be powerless, and we're not going to be weak. So the first century believers, they had doctrine and hope, but they lived in a present tense, intimate relationship with God that enabled them to endure with joy. They endured so much suffering, and they did it with joy. I mean, who sings and shouts when they're shackled in a prison? so that others may be free. They didn't even care if they were going to be free. They were doing it because, I mean, who does that? Sons and daughters who know eternal life and who have the lordship of Jesus Christ before them and everything. Um, uh, Just a little bit of history, because I also love history. In Rome, when Christians were being burned at the stake, they would sing praises to God And history says, just imagine that. They're burned at the stake and they're singing while they're burning. And history says that there were times when Nero, the emperor, would stick his fingers in his ears saying, why must these Christians sing? Why must these Christians sing? That is the power of the praises of God that comes out of our mouths, not the praises of God that you think about quietly. It's time. It's time to sing it out. It's time to be the blasting sound, the trumpet sound. We've got to let it out, guys. So can I tell you something even better than just that? The Romans that were jeering in the crowds and the stands, watching, I mean, how awful awful is that just to watch people being burned at the stake and jeering and like wow there were romans in the stands jeering and as they saw christians singing as they were being burned they risked their lives willingly they ran from their stands to these apostles and the christians just to know what these believers possessed So the life that those, those believers were living was very contagious. It was something that a sinner would be interested in risking their lives for to find out, how on earth could you be doing this right now? I want that. So ask yourself this question, is your walk with God like that? Are there people that are envious of your walk with God? Oh, not a heavy it's just, it spurs me on to go, oh, Lord, imagine the way you love God, the way you worship him, the way you share him with others. Is it contagious? Do people Are people watching you? If not, is he Lord? 
so I'm coming to an end here. You might be sitting here thinking, wow, I want that too, but how do I get there? That's the question most of us ask. I want that, but how do I get there? Well, the invitation by the Spirit for His bride now is that we begin to seek Him at a level of a forsaken life. It's different now. Something shifted. There's another level, there's another gear. You can feel it in the spirit realm. So we need to respond. And so to, to seek him now, maybe will look different the way you sought him yesterday or last year or 20 years ago. We have to seek him at a level now from a, an of a forsaken life. That I am I, it's no longer I that liveth. Come on, Rosemary, you can sing it with me. <laughs> it's no longer I that liveth, but Christ that lives in me. It's a forsaken life. Now we seek him with that. We don't seek him anymore with a whole bunch of stuff coming just because we have one foot there and we quite like that still. We can't take it into this move of God. We can't do it. He will wait for us. And we'll go through another waiting game and another circle and cycle and whatever you want to do. It's the time is now, and he wants us to respond. I'm still, as I say, I just see him waving. He is doing a new thing. So I forsake my old thinking. I forsake my old desires. I forsake my flesh daily, and I choose him. But I don't just choose him because I love him and want to follow him. I choose him also for his way, his terms, his power and not mine, his will, not mine, his word and not my emotions, not my opinion, his word. Colossians 3 Verse 1 to 5, I just want to read this. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. It just has more meaning, a new meaning today, guys, because he's doing a new thing. Everything is a new for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. And verse 5 says, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. And then it goes on to say, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desires, and covetousness, which is idolatry. You see, if we're carrying those things around, guys, if we're still tolerating those things and we're carrying, it's idolatry and he's not Lord. We can't have both. He's a jealous God. He, he wants to be the only true God. He wants to be your one true love. And our hunger for him in this moment, must supersede our need for a comfortable, convenient life. Our hunger must supersede it. And you know what I'm telling you now? A comfortable, convenient life is boring, and it's overrated. It is. And life in Him is adventurous, it's exciting and it's powerful. So let's steward our hearts. Let's make him truly Lord as we live to know him and to have eternity in our hearts. Shall we stand?